we study his word this morning. Let's go to it. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for your word. Lord, we thank you for the privilege to be able to come into your house. Lord, to call upon your name. Lord, to study your word and worship you. God, we just we don't take these freedoms for granted, Father, but we're looking toward you this morning. God, we just ask you to send your spirit to lead us into truth this morning. Lord, as we study your word, and it's in Jesus' name that we ask it. Amen and amen. God's compassion for all people. God's compassion for all people. Thank God for his compassion that he showed each and every one of us. Our key verse this morning is Isaiah 55 and 1. It says, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Introducing the study says God's plan to include not just the children of Israel, but all of humanity in his plan of salvation is clear in the book of Isaiah. While the first hearers of Isaiah's message were the people of Judah, it's evident from today's study that the message is for all people, for all times. The invitation is in Isaiah 55 and 1, our key verse, is an oft-quoted passage showing God's compassion and provision for all who will come to Him. And as we study this passage about God's provision and God's compassion, one thing we're going to be trying to do and understand this morning is to understand that God's invitation to receive His mercy and pardon has been issued to all people, not just to select few. There are those that would teach that it's already decided who's going to be saved and who's going to come to the Lord and that but my Bible says, whosoever will. Whosoever will. We're also going to learn to respond to his invitation in such a way that includes daily obedience and spiritual growth. What do you think? What best brings spiritual growth than daily obedience? You know what? We need to strive not to be hearers only of the word, don't we? But to be doers. That's the obedience part. And also, our last learning objective, to identify specific people who need to be reached with the gospel. And folks, I'll tell you what, it's usually not very hard to identify the ones that need to be reached with the gospel, is it? It's, it's usually pretty much readily recognizable. One of our, our commentary asks us for an opening activity, a question about God's provision from your life or from the testimony of someone you know what examples can you share of taking a step of faith and obedience to God believing that he would follow through with increased provision and blessing and what's been the outcome has there ever been a time that you've took a step in faith and obedience to God not knowing really where that next step is headed and not knowing what's going to take place. I'll tell you what, if you don't have the faith to do that today, you can get in trouble pretty quick. Because I'll tell you what, in the events of the last week or so, I'm going to be real honest with you folks, I don't know what's going to happen. And I don't know for sure which way this country is headed, but I know one thing. I know in whom I have my faith and my trust, and I know that He is able God has great plans for his people if they will trust and follow him. God's plan for the people of Judah was far beyond anything that they could see or understand, especially amid difficult circumstances. Although having children is greatly valued today in ancient Israel, having or not having children greatly impacted your standing and well-being in society. At key points in the Old Testament, God intervened in the plight of a barren wife. And folks, there was a lot more riding on this than this social status. In this day and time we're talking about here, if you didn't have any children, you didn't have anybody to take care of you when you got old. Thank God we have a society now that's set up and we have safety nets, as you, as you might call them. If you get able to not take care of yourself, there's provisions that can be made for you and ways to help you along. 
in these times that we're talking about here, that that wasn't there. If you didn't have if you didn't have children, you might have a rough elderly age. But God had intervened on the plight of a barren wife and brought a birth of a historic significance. Consider the stories of Sarah and Rachel and Hannah, and we know those accounts from Scripture. The sons born in these situations all played key roles in the larger history of God's people. Repeatedly, God used a divinely orchestrated human birth to carry forward His plan to provide spiritual rebirth. Part one of God's everlasting mercy and kindness. We're going to be reading out of Isaiah 54. Isaiah chapter 54. We're going to read the first two verses. It says, Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear, break, bring, break forth into singing and cry aloud, thou that didst not travail with child, for more are the children of, desolate, of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. Enlarge the place of thy tent, and let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitations. Spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes. Now, living by faith sometimes calls for actions that, not, that do not seem logical. When God told the barren woman to sing and rejoice... It would not seem logical based on the values of the day. Neither did it seem logical to tell her to enlarge her tent. If she was barren, why would she need more space? But God is not limited to the logical. He was using this as an illustration of his great plans for his people. Although they would go into bondage, he would bring them back and make their influence larger than ever before. Folks, that's why the Bible teaches, and we know as Christians, that we do not walk. As Christians, we do not walk by sight. All of God's children walk by faith and not by sight. If we walked by sight, I'll tell you what, I don't know. We would be forever more uh, fearful in these days. But from the Word of God, we know, and even in this, the text of this lesson today, that anything you know that, that the enemy comes up with against us is not going to prosper. As long as we are dependent on Christ and we're putting our faith, we're walking in faith and not by sight. Thank God we're not walking by sight today. But in Isaiah's day, a barren woman would have been pitied. And so the depiction of an enlarged tent in contrast to a barren woman would speak clearly to the future blessings of God that were being promised. The prophet invited the readers to make these, uh, these alterations on their tent in faithful anticipation of what God would do, to step out in faith and do this. Think how often in our walk of faith God invites us to find hope in expectation of His blessings to come to find hope in, ex, in expectation of his blessings to come. If we don't do that, then when, it, when God's promises begin to take place, we're not prepared to even receive them. And I'm talking, when I'm talking about stepping out in faith, I'm talking about like this church and our pastor buying the bus, believing that we're going to fill it up. We're going to bring these young people in here to learn about Jesus and to study his word. Had we not done that, we wouldn't be reaching those that we are over there. Some days they're filling the bus up and bringing those, those young people in. Isaiah 54 and 1 invites a song in the midst of barrenness. When we look beyond the historical context of God's people facing judgment and exile into a distant foreign land, this gives us a compelling picture of the experience of the redeemed. In ourselves we live barren lives and emptiness, powerfully expressed through the imagery of a barren womb. Yet because of God's saving work in us, we can become fruitful and contribute to bring a new life into the world. God not only transforms our lives through the work of Christ, but He leads us in communicating the gospel to others and inviting them to a relationship with Him. 
We should expect to see others brought into the kingdom as we obey the leading of the Holy Spirit and proclaim the gospel. In this way, the tent in which we dwell is enlarged. Why would we go and witness and try to reach others if we didn't believe that they would come in, that God would bring them in? Questions. What cultural expressions in Isaiah 54 and verses 1 and 2, which we just read, what expressions would have special meaning to Isaiah's original audience? Well, of course, the main thing, that barren womb. And telling them to expand their tent when obviously in their eyes why <laughs> how can believers today relate to the image of a barren woman how can we relate to the image of a barren woman could be the church today not reproducing couldn't it sure lack of fruit isn't it that's right Rejoice in God's promises. Let's read verses 3 through 10. It says, For thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed, neither be thou confounded, for thou shalt not be put to shame, for thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth and shalt not remember the reproach of thy widowhood any more. For thy maker is thine husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth shall be called, shall he be called. For the Lord hath called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, and a wife of youth, when thou hast refused, saith thy God. For a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment. But with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. For this is as the waters of Noah unto me, for as I have sworn that the waters of Noah could no more go over the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be wroth with thee, nor rebuke thee. For the mountains shall depart, and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from thee, neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed saith the Lord that hath mercy on thee. Now the promises of God are sure, but his timing and plan may differ from our expectations. When the people of Judah were instructed to expand their tent, they could have, they could have perceived that they were going to become a great nation right away. However, there would be a time of exile followed by a return to their homeland. There they would be ruled by the Roman Empire centuries later. Even when the Messiah came, the fulfillment of the promise did not match their expectations. His, closet, his closest disciples wondered when Jesus would set up his earthly kingdom. The call to expand one's tent precedes the promise that the people of God will multiply and spread throughout nations. On one level, Isaiah 54 and verse 2 and 3 offers the promise of renewed growth and expansion of the people of Jerusalem following their exile. But this verse also has a beautiful allusion to the growth and expansion of the church. When the next verses are considered, the promises that God offers His people can be seen in the, in the context of the New Testament church. Verse 4 promises freedom from fear shame and disgrace for the Christian. These most clearly connect with freedom from the effects of sins. God our Creator is also called our husband. A word picture similar to John's vision of Revelation in the church as the bride of Christ in Revelation. This relationship is only possible through Christ's identity as our Redeemer, a role that He fulfills thanks to the measureless power that He possesses as the God of all the earth. Much of Judah's history is summarized in verses 6 through 8, including events that Isaiah prophesied following centuries of idolatry and rebellion. God's people would be driven from their homeland to endure exile in lands of their conquerors. But God would call them back. 
renewing his covenant presence among them after allowing them to suffer the consequences of their actions. His divine anger would be felt for a season. For the Christian, a wonderful promise emerges in the contrasting time elements of these verses. God does judge sin, but he desires to do so only for a season. His redemptive goal is to transform sinful lives so that they can be brought into His presence for eternity. The references to God's judgment of a moment in verses 7 and 8 sits next to the promise of God's everlasting kindness and compassion. Verses 9 and 10 offer historic and even apocalyptic end-time promises of God's unfailing love. But within these large-scale pictures of His commitment, the Christian can rest in his personal assurance of God's mercy. Questions. What similarities do you see between Isaiah's original audience and the Christians of today? Well, they were, even after these promises were given to them, they were taken captivity. Uh, even right on up until the time of Christ and during the time of Christ they were ruled by a foreign power the Romans had control the Romans ruled them and they were under their rule and that's one of the things that they expected the Messiah to free them from folks we have a lot of preconceived ideas about how God is going to take care of things and usually we kind of mold our preconceived ideas into what we think God's going to do. God may not do it like we're expecting. We're living in a time right now, I don't know about you, but I firmly believe we're living in a time when we're a lot closer to being ruled by foreign powers. And I'm talking about, I'm talking about world orders. I'm not talking about even, even, even one specific nation. But as this world comes together and they realize that they have power in numbers and the more things that they can do to rule this world, I totally think, and I know God can take care of things instantly. He can bring His will to pass instantly. But it seems to me in studying His Word that this one world power is going to have to take place before the end comes when it's talking about the Antichrist and a lot of these things, these accounts that we read about in the Word of God. And I don't know for sure how that's going to take place. But I know one thing, there is a lot of similarities between what God told His people through the prophet Isaiah that we're studying this morning and things that are taking place today and the way things are shaping up. What, we, what can we learn about the nature of God and His attitude toward humanity? That He doesn't punish long. He will judge sin. He will judge sin, but I'm going to tell you something. I firmly believe, and that's the way that I think God in His love and kindness and His mercy and His patience is, that He don't draw it out. He'll get it over with, and if we'll accept Him, we can be renewed. God's promise to His people. Jerusalem will be restored. Let's read verses 11 through 15. It says, O thou afflicted, tossed with tempest and not comforted, behold, I will lay thy stones with fair colors and lay thy foundations with sapphires, and I will make thy windows of agates and thy gates of carbuncles and all thy borders of pleasant stones. <coughs> Excuse me. And all thy children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of thy children. In righteousness shalt thou be established. Thou shalt be far from oppression, for thou shalt not fear, and from terror, for it shall not come near thee. Behold, they shall surely gather together, but not by me. Whosoever shall gather together against thee shall fall for thy sake. Now when God promised the restoration of the city of Jerusalem, He was speaking both in a physical and a spiritual sense. The city would be restored after the exile that would come upon them. But beyond that, the city would be restored in a spiritual sense as the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. This promise applies to every believer of all time. We'll be part of that new Jerusalem. 
Woven throughout Isaiah's prophecies are references to Jerusalem and Zion. The names refer to the same city. And that city has held a central role in God's redemptive work in human history. From the earliest references in Abraham's day to the prophesied conclusion of this world's history in Revelation. The references in Isaiah chapter 54 verses 11 and 12 to a city built of, of precious stones foretells the description of the new Jerusalem within the new heavens and earth. If you want to read more about it, you can go over to Revelation chapter 21. But even when Scripture directs attention toward the city of Jerusalem, the purpose of those references is to, is to reinforce the truths concerning God's actions on behalf of His people. Idealistic pictures of Jerusalem are never just about foundations of precious stones or any other structural detail. God's redemptive actions are ultimately aimed at its inhabitants. Verse 13 speaks of the descendants of the righteous being taught by the Lord. His wisdom and knowledge among them will be a source of great peace. As a current application within this promise for the future, Christians who live according to God's wisdom experience His peace. If you don't live according to God's wisdom in these times, you're not going to be experiencing very much peace. Take a look around. Look at the news. It just seems like they're just in one big row, pointing out each other's shortcomings and just railing on them. I mean, it's just, I, I can't, I mean, I just can't watch it. <laughs> I turn it off. I turn it off. But one day, Folks, if we, don't, if we don't live according to God's wisdom, I guess that's maybe that's according to God's wisdom that I turn them off. <laughs> that way I can have peace. <laughs> because you can't have peace and in, 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 in try, to, try to keep up with all that. But one day the city of Jerusalem will be impervious to attack as described in verses 14 and 15 until God's people reach this great city of hope. God promises the power of the Spirit to resist temptation to find freedom from fear. To resist temptation and to find freedom from fear. The Word. Sure, it helps us. If you've, if you've not tried it, you need to try it. Next time you're tempted to do something you know you shouldn't do, quote God's Word. See if it doesn't give you strength. See if it doesn't help you. Right. Sure. Sure. But if you experience, if you, if you take His Word into consideration, you hide it in your hearts, not only that you might not sin against Him, but that, that you might have peace. The only way you're going to have peace in this world is through Christ. The only way. Nothing else in this world is going to bring you peace, ultimately. One day the city of Jerusalem will be impervious to attack as described in these two verses that we're talking about. But until God's people reach that great city of hope, God promises the power of the Spirit to resist temptation and to find freedom from fear. Opposition to the gospel in the church will continue to be realities until Christ returns. And they will get worse. Just as they are getting worse at this time. I tell you, it never ceases to amaze me. One will say that they believe that Christians are so silly. They believe in these fairy tales and they're just so silly. They'll turn right around and tell you that they believe in doing their little yoga exercises and their meditation. It don't add up, folks. They're, they are so they are so engulfed by the enemy and I'm talking about spiritually that they can't see. They're, they're blind and blinded to it. and They're in darkness.
They'll t they will. They'll kill babies and turn right around and say it. But his followers can live with the joyful hope of their ultimate victory even as they trust him to carry them through the trials and the challenges of today. And folks, I want to pr promise you the only way that we're going to come through this with peace in our hearts is to put it in God's hands. I'm talking about to trust Christ for our victory and our only source. What might the description of Jerusalem adorned with precious stones tell us about God's promises for us? These descriptions of the new Jerusalem adorned with precious stones tell us that God has promised us if we're true to Him, we live for Him, we accept Christ, we embrace His Word, we live a life that's pleasing to Him, that there is a reward. That there is a war reward. Folks, I don't care what all these modern teachers are going to tell you. That They can tell you that there ain't going to be a new rapture. They can tell you all these other things. But I promise you that there is a heaven to gain and there is a hell to shun. If we don't believe that today, then we're going to be forever and most men most miserable if we don't have that to stand on. What causes fear in your life today? And how can you find relief and deliverance from that fear? What causes fear in your life today? Folks, there is so much that if you let your mind dwell upon it that could, could bring you fear. There are so, there's so much evil. I'm not talking about on a national level either. I'm talking about on a local level. There's so many people pushing these drugs and things of this nature and getting our young people hooked on them. And they're going about and ruining their lives. If you don't pray for your the young people, for your kids and your grandkids in this day as they go out into this world. Because folks, they need, they need this influence of evil is is and it's just like I said, it's not just worldwide and it's not on a, just a national level, but it's also on a local level. But thank God. That no enemy will prevail. Let's read verses 16 and 17. Thank God that no enemy is going to prevail. Verse 16. Behold, I have created the smith that bloweth the coals in the fire and that bringeth forth an instrument for, for his work. And I've created the waster to destroy. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. God is the creator of all things, including even the enemy of our souls who chose to rebel against him. However, God's promises, his servants, victory over the enemy, his people will refute every tongue that accuses you. In Revelation 12 and 10, we read the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. What a blessing to know that in due time the enemy of our souls will be destroyed. Speaking through the prophet, God proclaimed a deep mystery about his own power. <coughs> One with whom his followers have grappled through the ages. In Isaiah 54 and 16, God describes himself as the one who gives the blacksmith the ability to forge weapons. He's also the creator of the destroyer. Then in verse 17, God promised protection for his people from those evil forces. Throughout scripture, we see two principles restated. God is the creator of everything, but God is not the author of evil. There are many instances in both the Old and New Testaments when physical weapons caused injury and death to godly people. But woven throughout that narrative, God's plan of redemption carried forward because of Christ's death and resurrection. Christians have the promise of victory over Satan's attempts to destroy them spiritually. Ultimately, God's followers will witness his eternal victory over Satan. A key word in verse 17 here is helpful in evaluating the long-term nature of this promise of protection. Isaiah speaks of the heritage of the servants of the Lord. 
God promises great blessings for His faithful servants, yet these are only partially realized in this world. Contrary to the claims of some, the Christian cannot guarantee personal wealth and health and trouble-free life by repeating certain Bible verses. The believer's heritage, however, gives ample promise that blessings will be revealed and fulfilled over the course of God's eternal plan. There are some people who totally believe that a Christian can guarantee their wealth and their health and trouble-free life by just simply repeating certain Bible verses over and over. I'll tell you something. God is sovereign. If you honor Him, He honors His Word. But He is sovereign. Some people believe that contrary to however they've lived and whatever they've done, if they can repeat a certain Bible verse that God suddenly becomes their slave. That He has to do their bidding because I've quoted this scripture. I'm going to tell you something. God's Word is true. And God's laws are just. And not one jot or one tittle of them will pass away. But from what I've studied about his word when we come to him and we serve him and we follow him we're going to be of all men hated and despised and abused what did Christ tell us to expect did he tell us to expect all our happiness will be granted anything that makes us unhappy will be taken away and everything that makes us happy will be multiplied he said, they hated me before they hated you. What do you think they're going to do to you? They're going to deliver you up to the leaders and to the courts and to prison. Slander you in all sorts of ways. Yes, you can ultimately, even going through all that, ultimately have that peace. That peace of knowing where you're headed and knowing who gets the last laugh because all these things that God, are, God is going to judge each and every man has an appointment that they will stand before the judgment seat of Christ of God but the thing about it is we may have a lot of trouble between now and then vengeance is mine saith the Lord I'll repay but there may be some things that we have to put up with between now and between then. If you're listening to somebody that tells you that they, you come to the Lord and everything's going to be a rose garden from then on, they don't have a good full understanding of the Word of God. He promised there would be tribulations and that there would be trials. How can followers of God maintain faith and hope even when God's promises seem far away and in the future? How can you maintain faith and hope? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing the Word of God. We study God's Word, we hide it in our hearts and we believe it. And we walk by faith and not by sight. That's the only way that we can even hope to maintain this faith and hope during the time. What challenging circumstances do you face? What biblical promises can you apply to those situations now? What promises give you hope for God's blessing beyond those challenges? Think about those things. God's invitation to the nations. We're going to read the first nine verses of chapter 55. Isaiah 55 and 1 through 9. It says, Ho, every one that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. And he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do ye spend money for that which is not bread? and your labor for that which satisfieth not. 
Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good. And let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear, and come unto me. Hear, and your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Behold, I have given him for a witness to the people, a leader and a commander to the people. Behold, thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not, and nations that knew not thee shall run unto thee because of the Lord thy God and for the Holy One of Israel. For he hath glorified thee. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now God's plans or far above any human plans that we can make. While the people of Judah were looking at their current situation, God was looking far beyond it. He was going to use them to reach the nations. How could he do that? Through accepting the Messiah, who would come from the lineage of Judah. All of humanity could be reconciled to him. Each one of us included in these, is included in these verses. In Isaiah 55, God issued a wonderful invitation resting on two powerful truths outlined in verse 1 and expanded on in the verses following. First was this universal invitation to all people. And second, God called on all to receive blessings which will be revealed by God's grace, not because of human merit or ability. Verse 2 asks a rhetorical question of Isaiah's audience. Why would anyone rely on their own limited resources to obtain flawed and limited benefits? There would be no need for the question if God had already determined who he would bless and whom he would condemn. But the people would have the freedom to turn to <coughs> excuse me. The people would have the freedom to turn to God in response to his invitation or ignore him and continue their futile search for fulfillment and meaning of life. Such an invitation continues today. God's plan for our lives immeasurably surpasses anything that we might accomplish for ourselves. Our souls can delight in the richest affair and experience true life. That these promises ultimately have their foundation in Christ becomes clear when Isaiah prophesies of their eternal nature. The everlasting covenant and their Davidic identity. While Isaiah's audience could look back on the splendor of David's reign. The Christian can also see Jesus, David's descendant, is truly the one who is witness to the peoples of the world. Verse 5 again points to the global scope of God's redemptive plan and the obedient witness of his followers that will speak to the nations. Verses 6 through 9 remind God's people, including believers today, that our sin separates us from God and there's a limited season in this life during which we can accept God's offer of salvation. Those who respond in faith during the time of opportunity must turn from sin in their actions, their thoughts, and their motivations. When they do so, they discover that God freely offers mercy and pardon. The immeasurable gulf between God's exalted nature and our lowly sin-flawed existence can be bridged, but only through the bridge of salvation that God has provided. So folks, even believers today, these threads that go th completely through the Word of God from beginning to end, and these truths of things like Sin separates from God. Sin separates from God. And there's only a limited season that we can accept God's salvation. I'm sorry, when that heart beats that last, you know, I've heard it said, and, I, and, and it's a good saying, it says we're one heartbeat away from eternity. We're literally one heartbeat away from eternity from eternity 
if you've lived your life selfishly and according to the only of the things that you wanted and the only the things that you were interested in and you never acknowledged God in any of your ways when you take that last breath and that heart beats that last time the word of God says whichever direction the tree falleth that's where it lays that's where it lays and these truths throughout the word of God but the thing about it is not only can these truths strike fear to our heart and draw us to at times to, to cry out in prayer to him they can also comfort our hearts when you know that whichever way that tree falls that's how it lies if you know that you've taken care of your responsibility and, and uh, toward God and that you've served him to the best of your ability and you've accepted that sacrifice that he made on your behalf and I'm talking about as the old folks said you can know that you know that you know that you're saved and which way you're headed so at the same the very same scriptures and the very same truths that can bring strike fear in one person's heart can comfort another it depends on what perspective and where you're looking at it from but when we believe and we discover that God freely offers this mercy and this pardon that we're talking about and we've got our right hearts right with him it can get pretty rough and we'll be able to handle it how does Isaiah 55 and 1 through 9 acknowledge that people must choose or accept to reject God's invitation it's one way or the other in life there's one quote I like and I don't even know who to attribute to I, I heard it myself I didn't come up with it myself but it says life has many choices eternity has two eternity has two you're not going to have to spend a whole lot of time deciding which choice you're going to make to what degree did you resist God's invitation to salvation before accepting Christ were you hard headed did it take a while me <laughs> why do you think you resisted him why do you think you resisted him we don't call ourselves number one for nothing folks if we don't have our mind on others and helping others and our mind on God and striving to live a life that's pleasing to him we're going to be looking out for number one it's called human nature it's called human nature and that is unfortunately what most people do and that's what drives most people they look out for number one and it's only through God's love through working through us and talking about God's invitation to salvation and this is why we resist so long we don't want to turn control over to somebody else we want to control our own destiny we want, to, we want to control ourselves so therefore it is in the flesh it's the hardest thing you probably ever do to turn yourself over to God and say God it's in your hands but that's what we have to do to be saved because in being saved what we're doing is responding to his word let's read verses 10 through 13 it says for as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and returneth not thither but watereth the earth and maketh it bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth it shall not return unto me void but it shall accomplish that which I please and it shall prosper in the things whereto I sent it for you shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace the mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree and it shall be to the Lord for a name for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off now God's word produces results <coughs> just as the rain and the snow fall down from heaven to water the earth and produce crops so the power of God's word accomplishes its purpose 
the concept of the Word is often referenced in Scripture. As a result of God simply speaking His Word, this universe came into existence. Throughout history, God has continued to speak with divine power to shape human lives collectively and individually. His written Word, God's all who will both read and apply its truth, and the living Word, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, is the fulfillment of the great written promises concerning redemption. Isaiah extolled the great virtues and significance of God's Word in Isaiah 55, verses 10 through 13. By His Word, the world was made and functions properly. In a sense, the intricate nature of creation is a constant reminder that we cannot comprehend the ways of the Lord. God's Word should always be at work in the life of the believer. Through His Word, we learn and follow His purposes. Ultimately, our relationship with Jesus Christ brings to fruition God's plan for our lives. The result is deep fulfillment and joy, both in this life and the life to come. When you plant a garden, how much credit do you take for what grows? How can you liken this to acknowledging God's power over our own abilities? Folks, when you raise a garden, how much credit can you take? Not much. I don't care hard you, how hard you work. I don't care if you work. I don't care if you go through there every day. Goose all that grass out of that row. Pull a little dirt to this. Give it a little water if it needs it, if you're able. You can do all these things to help it along. But how in the world does that dead seed come back to life and sprout and begin to grow? I can water it. I can till it. But I can't make it grow. And there's nothing that I can do to do it. It, 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 it's, it amazes me to this. I, I, I can plant something and see how a tiny seed can grow up and become a, a large plant that would nourish you and your family. And yet that's how God's Word works too. We plant seeds. But it's God that performs that miracle of making it grow and making it produce fruit. Yes, we can help it along. We can do our duty and help it along all we can. But until we realize that God gets most of the credit, because there's no way. I, I mean, I could, I could break that garden up and hoe them rows from now on if God's touch was not in that seed in life that He put there. I'd be doing it for nothing. How does God's Word shape and guide your life on a daily basis? How does God's Word shape and guide your life on a daily basis? If it's not shaping your life on a daily basis, then you need to, you need to change your ways. What is God saying to us? God has given every believer the responsibility of proclaiming the gospel to the lost. The church is the means by which He communicates His truth to the nations. Can't believe it what we got through ahead of time. Let's go to the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for your word. Lord, these truths that we've heard here today, that we've read from your word, God, help each and every one of us to apply them to our lives. Lord, as we even even with our dealings with others, God, that we would apply your precepts. Lord, and your laws to our hearts. And God, help us to find satisfaction and, Lord, peace in these troubled times as we stand on your word. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen.